Welcome back to church for the rest of us. Jimmy Scroggins here at Family Church downtown in West Palm Beach. Here with my co-host, Leslie Bennett, engineer Carly Seelman. I don't know why I had a hard time saying Carly, but I did. And uh, our friend Sam Chan um, from Australia, and he's actually recording this from Australia at 5.30 in the morning. And so Sam is an expert on... Um, he's an expert on evangelism. He's an expert on visual communication. He's actually an expert communicator. Brilliant guy, PhD in theology. Also, he's a medical doctor, a surgical assistant. So I think, Sam, you told us you, you if, if I need leg surgery, you hold my leg and the other guy cuts on it. That's right. Well, just like the mechanic needs someone to hold, you know, the hood of the car up when they change the oil on your car, the surgeon actually needs someone to hold your leg. That is my job. And, you know, I've got the most important job because if you've ever had an operation, you know, we're so worried we're going to do the wrong leg. At every major stop, we say, which leg, which leg, which leg. <laughs> leg and you have to forever say this leg this leg this leg and then they put you asleep and it all comes down to which leg i pick up first and i wasn't there for any of those conversations so i'm the weak link in the chain i'm the point of failure and you know we get it wrong 50 percent of the time and if we get the wrong side we throw the other side in for free so it's all good boy that's really Super encouraging. Super comforting. Ah, man. Remind well, me know, not they, they to go to Australia call... for leg surgery. Mm. That's right. It's that saying, what do you call a medical student? They got 50% in their exams. You call them doctor. That's all you need to know to be a doctor. <laughs> That's right. Well, Sam, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, last, last episode, uh, we talked a lot about evangelism. And so for listeners who were not able to hear that yet, I'd encourage you to go listen to it. It's excellent. It's very practical, and it'll encourage you, um, especially on how to talk about Jesus and have gospel conversations in a COVID-19 world. But now, Leslie, we want to talk about something else. About communication, which is very near and dear to my heart. And we've learned already so much from you, Sam. And so we just wanted our listeners to learn something from you when it comes to communicating in this new COVID world where we're communicating online a lot of the time. And you've really put out some great material. So um, we just wanted to hear from you why, how any pastor or ministry leader, first of all, why should they be thinking about the ways that they're communicating? Yeah, so as we said in the last episode, if you go to bit.ly slash post COVID playbook, I with my I work for City Bible Forum and with City Bible Forum we've put out the post COVID playbook. And part of it was because suddenly overnight all of us are now talking to a camera and a screen. We up until now, some of us we've had twenty or thirty years of experience, we've done our ten thousand hours of ministry in front of a crowd but suddenly overnight we've had to start all over again because we're talking to a screen from our study or bedroom and none of us have done this before and this is a unique moment because it's, it's changed everything in ministry because whether we like it or not online looks like it's going to be here to stay and it's like that moment with paul with pax romana and the roman roads the printing press and luther and the internet war and at least what it's done is it's meant our implied audience has changed. So I say this because with City Bible Forum, I, I used to do, well, I still do lunchtime Bible talks. And this is what a lunchtime Bible talk looks like. We book a venue, it might be a church, and 30 workers turn up with their lunches and I'll give a talk and then they go back to work. But now that we've gone online, 300 people tune in. So suddenly there are 10 times more people watching. And we find that with our church services, you know, like normally at my church, we might get 100, 150. We're a small church and suddenly 700 people are watching. So the numbers are bigger and there's an ongoing impact as well, because it means you can send your neighbor a link to the church service and they might not click immediately, but they might click next week a year later or 10 years later. So it's almost become like a Gideon Bible. Because you know when you go to a hotel, you think, <laughs> who reads a Gideon Bible? But then at two in the morning, if you're a lonely business person, you just might. And I think it's the same with what we produce. People might not immediately see what we do, but they might one week from now, a year from now, even 10 years from now. So it's exactly what's happened to Paul and his letter. So Paul writes a letter to the Thessalonians and he says, you remember how we lived among you? 
But now that same letter speaks to us 2,000 years later in a different continent. Martin Luther writes a letter to his buddies in Wittenberg in Germany in the 1500s. But that same letter speaks to us in a different country 500 years later. And that means our implied audience is not, has changed in terms of both space and time. And also our implied audience in the past might have been 1% non-Christian, because, you know, we always get told to speak as if there's a non-believer in front of us. But deep down, we think, well, there's no non-believer in front of me. <laughs> well, there might be 1% at the most. Now we don't know. It could be 10%, 50%. Who knows? It could be 80% of non-believers tuning in, because it's been way easier to invite a friend to watch a, a church service or whatever we produce online. You know, we found that, too, because we've had uh, all of these different people that we're friends with in the community and they're kind of favorable towards our church because maybe they work with people that go to our church or they their kids play in the little league or whatever with people go to our church but they don't actually come to our church because they're not christians and so getting your kids together and yourself dressed and coming all the way down here and going through how you check it's just such an ordeal that for someone who's only very marginally interested it's too hard but now they just click on we have people that are watching us every week that are not Christians because it's just easier. And so that's where we've learned, wow, we really do need to make our visual communication online as good as we can because of exactly what you're saying. They're not tuning in because they saw a commercial for it. They're tuning in because their neighbor's been inviting them to church for five years and they've mm -hmm. never come. But now it's a way for them to come. And the broadcast and our communication quality is better than it used to be, so they're willing to watch it. Oh, definitely. And it means we have to maybe rethink how we do online church. Yeah. It's the internet revolution. It's what happened when they invented the word processor. Because think about what used to happen before the word processor. Like my mum and dad, they would have hand write everything. Mum would up. Dad never used a typewriter. He dictated. And a paid secretary would then type up what he dictated. Suddenly the word processor comes and buddy... You have to do it all yourself now. No one is typing up anything for you. You have to do it yourself. I don't know. Do you remember college people offer their services? You pay them 20 bucks and they'll type up your paper for oh, you. Oh, yeah. Well, no one is doing that. Buddy, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. And now what's happened is we've all overnight had to produce video by ourselves. In the past, you know, someone would video you, do all the post-production. Well, no, guess what, buddy? You have to produce the videos yourself. <laughs> we've all had to become video makers overnight but the, it's always been coming if you think about it, because when i was in seminary at the end of the year they have a performance night for fun where we get up we sing we put on performances i've noticed now students hand in a three minute video of them doing a performance no one has a performance live anymore so video making is a new norm my 12 year old son in grade seven just last week, he had to hand in a geography assignment on video, not on paper anymore. So we all expect to produce video. And I think church has finally caught up. We have to produce videos now. It, it's here to stay. And here's the thing. Do you remember when the internet first came and we produced web pages and PowerPoint slides mm -hmm. and we thought all we had to do is get our pamphlet and whatever is written here, translate one-to-one -to, -one to HTML. And this was our web page or PowerPoint slide. And I just made bad, awful, <laughs> ugly web pages and PowerPoint yeah. slides. Now I realize it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And I think we're realizing the same with church. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. We don't just put a camera on and film what we used to do for 60 or 90 minutes. We have to actually change what we do. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. All right, so we're having lots of conversations at our church and with other churches. Um, and this is the conversation. So uh, do, do we... Do we have church on Sunday for our face-to-face -face audience as that's coming and create a separate production that's completely different? Or do we find ways to film what we're doing live? I'm interested in your perspective because I'm sure you've thought a lot about this. Yes, and we've all, we're all here for the very first time. There's no one who can come and say, oh, I'm my 10 years of experience. No, <laughs> none of us have 10 years of experience. Right. It's all like in my one month of experience of this. And at City Bible Forum, we, we have this challenge. Like when we used to run this thing for lawyers on Thursday mornings for breakfast, and we used to meet in a coffee shop and say 20 lawyers met at 7 a.m. and we give them a Bible talk. COVID isolation hits. We can't meet there. 
So we do something on screen and now 300 or it could be 700 people are watching, but from all over the world. Now that isolation's lifting and we can meet in a coffee shop again, what do we do? And right now we're, we're thinking we go hybrid, we run the same thing, we film it, and you got the whole local and distant audience thing, which is exactly what Paul had. Paul writes a letter to the Thessalonians, which is a local context, but we're enjoying it from a different time and country. And maybe it's the same. So maybe hybrid can be the way, but understanding that the production has to change. It's not a straight one to one correlation, like you say. We may have to mix up the chronological order of things. So I think one of the first things that has to change is we have to hook people at the start, you know, maybe with a question that they want answered. Because up until now, our regular church tenders, they turn up sleepy, they turn up five minutes late. So it's almost like, let's not put anything good in the in first the five minutes of the service because it's going to get wasted. It's not almost here. like that. It's actually like that. <laughs> let's make all the good stuff in the back half of the service and put the fluff in the front half of the service. But I think when things are online, the good stuff has to be up the front, almost like in the first minute or the first two minutes. Hook them at the start with something. I think that's and realizing a people are visiting. You know, I, I think in that first minute, our, our ministers are now realizing we have to say, hey, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And acknowledging it's more than just the immediate audience watching. So I love to say greetings today, whether you're in Sydney, Shanghai, or San Francisco, whether you're here for the first time or the 10,000th time, but click on the link below <laughs> so that someone can get in contact with you. And I think all of us are learning to do this actually now, aren't we? <laughs> click yeah. on the link below, yeah. like, subscribe, and, and so one of us can, can connect you with the church. We're knowing that we need to connect within that first minute. Hey, Sam, Bernie actually just walked in. Hey, Bernie, Come in here, man. This is very unprofessional podcast behavior, but come in here, Bernie. Come in here and join us. And uh, here, come over here and uh, see if we can. Are we zooming? Yeah, we're you zooming with Sam. Sam. Just come over here and share this microphone with me. Here you go. <laughs> Sammy, how are you, man? Bernie, it's so good to see you. Hey, thanks for helping us out. Hey, thanks for connecting us. This is a blast. And I was hey. just telling Jimmy, do you remember that motorcycle helmet? Oh, I did. In fact, I tried it on. We were walking around this um, uh, this motorcycle store. Sam, I felt like what was going through perhaps some sort of a midlife crisis. And uh, I was the first one to try on that helmet. Yeah, helmet just, on. I said, you got to buy this one. It's the coolest one. Well, That's I'm glad fine. that we did. All right. So we kind of interrupted our conversation. Yeah, we were sorry. all talking about. No, no. I'm just glad that you're. So we were talking about all of this, uh, all of this post-COVID communication and everything. Now we got Leslie off the camera. Oh, well, it's hard to social distance on a, in front of a computer Fine. screen. So I guess Bernie, ahead. if you got COVID, I'll get it too. So whatever. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Well, our kids are together every day, so we probably all got it anyway. They're all playing. They're, our kids are play football together. Oh, oh look yeah, at that! Speaking of kids. <laughs> all right. Just this, on cue. This podcast has gone to hell in a handbasket, hasn't it? <laughs> all right. But, but let's go back. So, so Sam, we were talking about the need, and, and you were talking about a hybrid and how you have to decide. Do you, If you were making a recommendation and a church had the ability, would you advise a church to have two separate broadcasts? Or, like, in other words, a live event and then a separate broadcast? Or would you say, no, try to find a way to do both? If a church had the resources. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, you know what? Maybe the answer is yes. Because I'm just about to speak in October at a church that does have the resources. And we're meeting. I, So I thought I was going to, when they say, can you preach at this church? I thought, sure, I'd love to preach at your church. I didn't know what I committed myself to. Apparently, <laughs> I have to preach live at two physical gatherings, one at 10 a.m., one at 5 p.m. And they want me to come in early in the week to pre-record another show that they, <laughs> they're going to make, just especially as, as a packaged pre-recorded show. So I think if you've got the resources, go for it. Because they're two different mediums. I think that's what we're realizing. They're, they're two different mediums. Well, what do you think about music on the recorded show? Like, how do we use music on the recorded broadcast? Wow. <laughs> these, are, these are big questions. You know, you can go for really, really high production quality. And the church I'm about to speak at in October has that. And they've got some of the best musicians in Australia. Some of these have been on TV shows. And I love watching what they do. But there 
for a big church. My church is a small church of 100 to 200 people. And this is almost this moment if your production quality is too good, it's almost distracting. Mm. So there's something, I think Timothy Keller has a great paper on this, hasn't he? Like what's appropriate for a church of 100, 1,000, 10,000 and 10,000 you do need the good production quality because poor production quality is distracting but in a smaller church you do need that homely village feel and I think people love just seeing people they recognize uh, just doing the best they can on screen and we, we sing along so I think something appropriate to the size of your church so because we're a church of 150 200 our music production is pretty good, but we deliberately just turn it down, just one or two musicians. So it's almost like MTV unplugged. Mm -hmm. So there's something very real, authentic and raw about it. Hmm. That's helpful, Sam, because I can imagine pastors of smaller churches during COVID feeling like, wow, I mean, there's no way I could compete with these large churches and large productions. And so what you're saying is it, it really doesn't matter as long as it's it's a bit what they're used to and there's a little bit of relational capital with the audience. Yeah, and I was just t chatting during the break with Jimmy. When COVID first came, all we were trying to do was survive, wasn't it? Like we didn't have any equipment because it was all stuck in China. And if you ordered a <laughs> microphone or camera, it was going to come in six months' time. It wasn't coming immediately. My son's trying to photo bomb me. He doesn't <laughs> see right. He's even dressed in black like a ninja, so he can sneak yeah. up on me. And and then so we were at bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just survival, just trying to put out sixty minutes of content, but just. Last month, I sat down with my church's online team and I said, okay, we're past survival. We've got a roster. We know what we're doing. We're smashing the stuff out each week. Okay, let's recast our vision. And I said, okay, we're just after two things. We have the permission to be excellent, permission to be creative, permission to be beautiful. Because I think, especially in Chinese Christian circles, there's this feeling that we shouldn't be too good otherwise we're showing off mm. i said no no we have permission to be excellent that's how we glorify and worship god but we also have the freedom to fail because up until now we all look like we're hostage people <laughs> on isis reading our lines you know because we're so scared of making a mistake on camera so we did two things we said okay we're going to put bloopers in and some churches put the bloopers in at the start but we put our bloopers in at the back and, and that gives the permission to have a laugh. It breaks down the fourth wall. And I, thought, I said, we'll begin with the passes. We'll show bloopers of the passes so they can take it. Show bloopers of me when I MC, I, I can take it. And we even show the person doing the slate. <laughs> Just again, showing that there's a production going on here. And it suddenly gave people the permission to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said to the music team, okay, how about you do one normal take uh, and then do a fun take, you know, like a fun family photo where you can mix up the genre, make it reggae, or just have fun, permission to make mistakes, pull funny faces. And that freed up them to suddenly realise, you know, we can have fun doing this. Until then, they were very, very rigid. And we can be beautiful, and we can be aesthetically beautiful, and we can be imaginative and, and as creative as we want. And then the pastors, when they do the announcements, we call it the pastors chat, we just try to come up with the most ridiculous scenarios where they have the chat. But they, they could be like in the kitchen or something or in the elevator going up and down <laughs> past each other as they have a chat. So each week just making it a bit more fun. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, Leslie, because we're trying to figure out how we communicate directly into the camera. I wonder if you have any thoughts or questions that, that you might want to bounce off of Sam, because that's what you really focus a lot of your time in, in doing that. Yeah, one of the questions that we have been debating as well. So when we first, we've been doing sort of a direct-to-camera shot, thinking people are in their homes, they're watching, they need to see direct-to-camera. Do we need to get up and start moving around the platform a little bit as Pastor Jimmy preaches? So curious to, um, what your thoughts in terms of, you know, people, like you said, they're watching it in a different venue. They're not in the room. They're in their living room. They're on their phone. What's most effective? Oh, okay. Well, everyone has their own personal style uh, and I, I you know when I watch stand-up comedians I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this but I love watching stand-up comics and I've noticed no one there's no one style to stand-up comedy some people hold the mic some people leave it in the stand some people wander some people stay still um, what would I say 
I like to watch the YouTubers and the game streamers and what they do, because they've mm -hmm. been doing this for five or 10 years. They're ahead of us. What do they do? And I, they don't tend to roam. So I like to stay still. And my pastors now, we don't have a teleprompter yet, but you know, the important thing is you need to speak to camera but they have their notes just on a table, just out of view. And I think I personally, if someone films me, I ask them to have me a, just a, from maybe from the waist up to here. So then I'm, I can use my hands. I remember speaking at one church where they had me. You know, I was just <laughs> like, so suddenly all my hand gestures were taken away from me because you could just see my shoulders moving. But I think, where are his hands? So I, I like this shot where at least I can show you my hands. Because one of the big things in communication is nonverbal. 90% of communication is nonverbal. And a lot of it comes from our hands. You know, if you can see my palms. It shows I'm friendly, I'm innocent, I'm harmless. And, and yeah, speak to camera. Maybe have your notes just out of you on a table and waist up and show your hands. That's good. Well, we found we use a teleprompter, and the reason we use it is because of exactly what you said. Well, one, it helps us be precise and stay on time. But the other thing is it forces you to look at the camera the entire time and you can't, oh, yeah. you know, cause so it's, it's hard not to look around the room when you're talking to a camera and there's people around. Yeah. So when I MC, I try to memorize my script. I'm trying to memorize my prayer. So I don't use any notes. My, my, preachers my pastors they need notes so they've been hiding out of you but we've ordered a teleprompter and it's finally come this week <laughs> all right there you go <laughs> so we're going to use it this sunday for the very first time and our pastors are very excited about that they cannot wait now how long do you me with my 53 year old eyes i can't read a teleprompter <laughs> right up there to see it how long do your how long do your uh how long do your preachers preach oh see they we used to go for like 30 minutes, I keep telling them, this is a different medium. You have to try to be 10, 15, 20 minutes max, and they, they cannot do it. I get on, I try to go for 10 or 15 minutes when I speak. My ministers, they, they've got it down to 25 or 20, but I simply told one of them the other day, instead of a three-point sermon, just make it a two-point sermon. No one says it has to be a three-point sermon, and he tried it the other day, so it worked. He got him down from 25 to 15 minutes just by making a two-point sermon and some of us are horrified you know like the 30 40 minute sermon is a sacred cow you've lost your faith in the text the power <laughs> of scripture yes but you know it, it's an arbitrary line like how long the sermon has to be but the medium has changed i think that's a big thing on screen it's very hard to hold someone for more than 10 or 15 minutes in a monologue the medium has changed yeah I think that's right because, like, even in ours, you're like, we'll we'll, we'll do a, an hour long broadcast or whatever, but the average view is like 32 minutes. So what are they watching for 32 minutes? I mean, that's that's the question. Like, do they watch one song and a half of the sermon? They just watch the sermon? Do they just watch the music? Like, I, I don't know what they did. Yeah, and also being understanding that a lot of people now are trying to watch this with their kids. Right, right, <laughs> right. And a lot of my friends love posting on social media pictures of them with their kids ready to watch the online service and they say and they joke underneath this will only last one minute you know, <laughs> the kids are just all over the place during an online service yeah. and we know that's just a harsh reality that kids can't sit still for more than 20 or 30 minutes so even if people want to listen for 30 minutes they can't their kids are distracting them hey if there's one thing that you would tell a, a pastor or a leader to do and they have limited equipment limited you know video expertise but what's one thing you know look everybody could at least do this to get better well <laughs> jimmy you're saying during the break at least turn your phone to landscape <laughs> not portrait. i think that's a first thing the second thing is have your head in the top half of the screen not 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 down there and <laughs> not in the bottom half of the screen have your webcam at least at eye level and not 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 shooting up your nose at you, <laughs> something like that and you know even just and then invest in a two dollar microphone the proximity from my mouth to my microphone makes all the difference i'm not relying on the the microphone that's in my laptop and then just good lighting so i actually I went to buy special studio lighting. So I say your study has now become your studio. Mm -hmm. Our study used to be where we produce written texts, but now our studies become a, a film studio. We've become filmmakers overnight. Yeah, so I wonder, Leslie, if you have a final thought or something you'd like to share uh, with Sam or ask Sam. 
Well, I would just say, I would just recommend to our listeners that you do check out Sam's other resources. What is the best place to find the videos that you produce? It's your YouTube channel, right? So could you tell our listeners where to find these videos? Because you have a lot of good tips Mm -hmm. on how you can produce excellent online communication. So I would recommend that all of our listeners go to where Sam tells you to watch their videos that they've already produced, and you will learn a lot. Yeah, so with City Bible Forum, we put out the post-COVID playbook, which goes into all of this, how to talk to camera on the cheap. We're not trying to say, hey, be amazing. Just do the best we can with what we have in our study or bedroom. So go to bit.ly slash post COVID playbook and you'll see all the YouTube videos there. They're only three or five minutes long at the most. And then there's a link you can click, leave your email address, and then we'll send you a PDF with a lot more information as well. That's great. That's incredible. Bernie, you're the one who uh, really has been friends with Sam for a long time. You brokered this relationship between Family Church and City Bible Forum and between Sam and I. So thank you for doing that. I wonder if you have some closing thoughts. No, I just want to thank Sam. His his ministry, his book on evangelism is one of the best books I've read in decades. Uh, he's just fascinating to listen to. He thinks outside the box. So when he speaks, I like to listen and learn from him. And hopefully we'll get him down to West Palm soon again. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Hey, Sam, thank you so much for not just for this podcast. I mean, your willingness to bend your schedule to be on here is phenomenal. But also just the resources that you are producing and you're making all of these things that you are learning and thinking about so accessible. And so I do want to encourage our listeners, if you're thinking, yeah, if I had the resources of family church, then I would be able to do whatever. Okay. That, that could be true, but Sam is going to tell you, I'm telling you, if you'll listen to his videos, go to the, go to the website, you will see how to do uh, the best you can and do better with what you have. Don't Mm -hmm. worry about what someone else has or what you don't have. What do you have and how can you serve the Lord and honor God and, And let's get the message of Jesus out there in a time when people are really, really searching. Sam, you have any closing thoughts? Uh, Just simply, it's been amazing being here. We're all doing the best we can (laughs) 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 from our homes, right? Right. Uh, Yeah, just thanks for having me here. It's been so good to connect. What a pleasure. So for everybody listening out there, I hope you'll go check out these resources. Thank you so much for joining us on Church for the Rest of Us. Hey, if there's any way we can help you, you want to email us, you want to call us, you want to jump on there and follow us on social media, connect with us. We are here to help you. We are accessible as well. We will do anything we can to help you, your leadership teams, lead your church as well. Even during the Corona apocalypse, I think this is a special time. It's a unique time. And God in his providence has put us in our places of service right now. So let's learn everything we can. Let's do everything we can for Jesus. And uh, thank you guys for listening. This is Jimmy Scroggins, Bernie Cueto, teaching pastor, family church, Leslie Bennett, my co-host, Carly Steelman, our engineer, Dr. Sam Chan. Introduce your son. Jaunty Chan. Jaunty Chan. This is us signing off. This has been Church for the Rest of Us.